So we are going to look tonight at a couple of different things before we get to moving heaven and earth. Um, we are going to talk about uh, how to read the Bible and go into that series. So let's uh, go there. And we are going to look at uh, design patterns in the Bible. So not the same thing as design patterns, you know, when we're talking about uh, room designs, so, you know, perhaps, but uh, design patterns in the Bible. So let's give this, give this a watch. We've been exploring how biblical narratives work, and it turns out stories in the Bible are like any other story. You've got to pay attention to the characters, the setting, and the plot. Yeah, these are the basic tools an author uses to help readers see the meaning and significance of the events. Now, it's time to learn one final skill that will bring all these elements together, how to detect design patterns in biblical narrative. What do you mean by design oh, yeah. patterns? Well, the biblical authors have shaped all these elements, coffee. character, setting, and plot, to create series of repeated patterns that weave through story after story and tie them all together. When you notice these patterns, you'll see how different stories across the whole Bible have been coordinated to emphasize key themes. This sounds interesting, but how do you know how to find a biblical pattern? Well, biblical authors do it subtly. The best way to catch on is to watch them embed key words and images that link stories together. Take, for example, one of the main themes of the Bible, the complex and tragic human condition. Okay. So let's start at the beginning, where God is making a really good world. Right, seven times it says God saw that it was good. So those are clearly important words. Now watch. God appoints two characters named human and life to rule this world on his behalf, and they're told that everything is good for them to eat. Except for the tree of knowing good and evil. So then the humans doubt God, and in Genesis we read, they see that it's good to take this knowledge for themselves. Then we read, they desire to become wise. And then finally, they take what they want. And everything falls apart. This story is about the human condition. And on its own, it's a really powerful story, but the biblical authors don't leave it there. They turn it into a pattern. It happens again with Abraham and Sarah. God brings them into the promised land, promises them a child, but they don't trust God. They get impatient and we read the same words. They see their Egyptian slave. They take her and do what is good in their eyes. Do you get it? Yeah, the stories match. Then you get to Aaron at Mount Sinai, and we read how he sees and then takes the gold of the Israelites to make the golden calf. Or there's the story about Achan, who sees the gold of the Canaanites. He desires it and takes it for himself. This pattern highlights how one person's temptation can create suffering for many people. Exactly. It's just like the story of Saul, where we read that the Israelites see him. They desire him and take him as their king so they can be like all the other nations. And Saul's reign leads them to destruction. Or there's the story of David, which says that he sees Bathsheba. He desires her and then takes her and then kills her husband. And then David's family starts destroying each other. So you see, it's just one basic theme repeated over and over. These stories are all designed to show the temptation pattern. Which is kind of a downer. But the repetition builds up anticipation. Perhaps someone will come and break the pattern. This is why the stories of Jesus have been designed to carry the patterns forward to their climax. Really? Yeah. Like, what does Jesus say when he's faced with his greatest temptation to avoid dying on the cross? Uh, not my desire, but your desire be done. So the pattern flips, and you have one person resisting temptation, and his suffering provides life for many. Very cool. Can we do one more? Totally. How about a big one? How God brings humanity through chaotic waters into a new world. It starts on page one, where God separates these dark, chaotic waters. Yeah, dry land emerges as a home for humans to flourish. Then the pattern reappears with the chaotic waters of the flood. God rescues this remnant, Noah and his family, through the waters so that they can step onto dry land and become humanity 2.0. Now, does that basic storyline remind you of anything else? Oh, right, the famous Exodus story. Yeah, exactly. That's when God saves his chosen people from Egypt by leading them through the waters onto dry land. While Pharaoh and his army is destroyed. The pattern repeats later with Joshua and the Israelites. They pass through the waters of the Jordan into the promised land. Yeah, you got it. So now you can see how later biblical authors will project this pattern into the future. Like Isaiah, he hoped for a new exodus with a new king leading God's people forward 
forward into a new creation. And in this repetition, the nations become the chaotic waters. Uh, so you can see how combining all these patterns brings us to Jesus. Yeah, notice how all the Gospels highlight that story of Jesus going to the Jordan River. He goes into the waters and back out again. His baptism. That's when God announces that Jesus is his son, who will rescue the world from the chaos of our evil and violence by going into death and out the other side. This is why baptism became such a big deal for Jesus' followers. It's about participating in this ancient pattern, going through the waters of death, following Jesus into the new creation. These design patterns seem really important. Yeah, they're actually the main way biblical authors have unified these hundreds of stories together. And every pattern develops a core theme throughout the whole biblical story that leads to Jesus. Great, that's biblical narrative, which makes up over 40% of the Bible. Now, another 30% is made up of ancient poetry. And learning to read biblical poetry is what we'll explore in the next videos. Okay. So let's take a moment there and kind of check in with what we heard and saw. Um, maybe just to name one major aha within that with what you just saw, if there was an aha. I think I found one because the way I always heard those stories, those patterns represented as you have a, a faithful people that are rebellious, they turn away, something happens, a kind of redemption occurs and then it happens again and it happens again and it happens again so that that's how I heard the pattern described as, as that, that, that what God was trying, God being the faithful partner and humanity being the unfaithful partner until you arrive at the time of Christ, where you have kind of the, the ultimate gift of fidelity. Thank but you. it was that pattern repeating itself over and over again. Right. They were really like a lot of their their videos like I had never really put that much thought <laughs> into the stuff that they're talking about so it's just like totally and those videos are like really engaging and I love our, I don't know if everybody else's does but sometimes our computer freezes up and we don't get the animation moving so like it just stopped on that first picture so I didn't get to see all the animation but they cover so much information and they go over it so fast that I have a hard time. Like I can't process it all like that. <laughs> so, so you could watch it over and over again. So that's, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad I'm not the only one though. Cause I'm like, how did they do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just like they're and I'm, and yeah. I'm still like, you know, back in the introduction. But I think one of the things that struck me too was, I guess I never really thought about the fact, only recently have I learned even, or, or kind of been told about that, you know, Jesus is sort of, his story is sort of that Exodus story and he's bringing into the, us into the new promised land. I, why that never occurred to me before, I don't know. But, you know, once it was pointed out, it makes such perfect sense, right? And, uh, and, but I never thought about the fact that people were consciously using the old stories that had that pattern and saying, you know, I'm going to use that pattern to look at the future, how we frame the future. Um, that's new to me. I like how it's very simplified. Um, they, they take this whole thing and just, um, and, and, and just make it simplified so that it is an aha moment for me. I just never gave the whole, situation i guess that much of an mm -hmm. of a thought that how everything interconnected and they just put it down to very basic terms are we on is there a is there a why to this i don't know how to frame this question um but when you think of all the different authors of biblical stories how did we land with a number of people using the same patterns? That's probably a really big question. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great question. 
because you're talking about authors of those stories who in some cases, um, hundreds of years apart. Yeah. It's kind of a pervasive theme and how does that happen from beginning to end? Yeah. Well, I think it's a good question. Maybe we'll get that one answered at some point. I hope that some of this, you know, as we're learning about plot or settings or design or any of that, you know, it's intended that as you pick up your Bible, even if it's to, you know, get ready for that you're the lector on Sunday, you know, that you begin to see that even that passage a bit differently, um, like to, the, those themes can kind of be, oh, I'm kind of sensing that or seeing that, or you read about, well, you know, what is the book of Judges about? Well, if you look at Judges, it is that it's just a constant roller coaster, you know, and hey, we think we're back on top and nope, you know, we're back down again. And then we get another chance and another chance. And it's like, ah, you know, you can see that larger motif in, in the whole thing and it makes it come alive a little bit more. I go back to that one video on um, Jewish meditation I just love that idea of the importance of, you know, we talk about reading scripture to yourself, even if it's just mumbling it to yourself, that you're reading it out loud and you just do it over and over and over because it's so rich and thick and compact. And yet it's right there. It's just very evident. All right. Anyone else before we move on to, uh, heaven and earth. Here we go. Let's go to heaven and earth. So in the Bible, the ideas of heaven and earth are ways of talking about God's space and our space. So I understand our space really well. We live here. There's trees, rivers, mountains. But my understanding of God's space gets a little fuzzy. And what we do get in the Bible are images trying to help us grasp God's space, which is basically inconceivable to us. So these are two very different types of spaces. Yes, they're, they're different in their nature, but here's what's really interesting is that in the Bible, these are not always separate spaces. So think of heaven and earth as like different dimensions that can overlap in the same exact space. So we talk a lot about going to heaven after we die, but this idea of heaven and earth overlapping, we don't talk a lot about that. Which is kind of crazy because the union of heaven and earth is what the story of the Bible is all about. How they were once fully united and then driven apart and about how God is bringing them back together once again. So let's go back to the beginning where heaven and earth, they're completely overlapping. Yeah, this is what uh, the Bible's description of the Garden of Eden is all about. It's a place where God and humanity dwell together perfectly, no separation, and, and humans then partner with God in building a flourishing, beautiful world and so on. But as humans, we wanted to do things a different way. We wanted God out and we wanted to create a world apart from him. Yeah, so we have these two spaces now. And the Bible actually uses lots of different kinds of words and phrases to refer to these two spaces to make a, a clear distinction. So you said that these spaces can overlap though. So explain how that works. Yeah, this is where we have to start talking about temples. Because in the biblical world, you experience God's presence by going to a temple. That's where heaven and earth uh, overlap. Now, there are two types of temples described in the Bible. One is a tabernacle, basically a tent that was built by Moses. And the other was this massive building made by Solomon. And these temples were decorated with fruit trees and flowers and images of angels and all kinds of gold and jewels and so on. And these are designed to make you feel like you're going back to the garden. And at the center of the temple was a place called the Holy of Holies, which was like the hot spot of God's presence. Now we can go and be with God again. But not so fast because the temple also creates a problem. So God's space is full of his presence and goodness and justice and beauty, but human space is full of sin and injustice and the ugliness that results. So how do these spaces overlap if they're so different and they're in conflict with each other? This was resolved through animal sacrifice. Yeah, that's kind of weird. What do animal sacrifices have to do with this? Yeah, the, the idea is this. 
animal sacrifices, somehow they absorb the sin when the animal dies in your place. And it creates a clean space, so to speak, where you are now free to enter into the temple and be in God's presence. Okay, so if I'm an Israelite and I live in Jerusalem, I might be able to be in God's presence. But you said the story of the Bible is all of heaven and earth reuniting. Right. So we have to keep going in the story where we come to Jesus in the New Testament. And in the Gospel of John, we hear this claim that God became human in Jesus and made his dwelling among us. Now, this word dwelling is really curious. It, literally, it means he set up a tabernacle among us. And so what John is claiming right here is that Jesus is a temple. He is now the place where heaven and earth overlap. What's interesting about Jesus is that he isn't staying in this safe, clean space. He's running around, hanging out with sinners. He's healing people of their sicknesses and forgiving people of their sins. He's basically creating little pockets of heaven where people can be in God's presence, but he's doing it out there in the middle of the world of sin and death. And he keeps telling everyone that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he even told his followers to pray regularly that God's kingdom come and that his will be done here on earth, just as it is in heaven. But a lot of people are threatened by Jesus and they kill him, which seems to spoil this whole plan to reunite heaven and earth. But we, we have to go back to a scene earlier on in Jesus' story where John the Baptist saw Jesus and said, Behold, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus isn't just talked about as being a temple. He's also talked about as being the temple sacrifice. Yeah, so, so the cross is now the place where Jesus absorbs sin to create a clean space that is not limited like animal sacrifices. Jesus' sacrifice has the power to keep spreading and spreading and reuniting more and more of heaven and earth. And this is all really great, but it leaves one big question in my mind, which is what happens when I die? Don't I just fly over to God's space to be with Jesus. Yeah, so a few times in the New Testament, we learn that Christians will be with Jesus in heaven after they die, but that is not the focus of the Bible's story. The focus is on how heaven and earth are being reunited through Jesus and will be completely brought together one day when he returns. So in the book of Revelation, we get this beautiful image of the Garden of Eden, now in the form of a city, coming to end the age of sin and death by redeeming all of human history in a renewed creation. And God's space and human space completely overlap once again. Okay. So let's just start with that first question there. And how did this video or did this video expand your view of heaven? Let's kind of begin with that. I did like the Venn diagram. It's kind of like what Marla said earlier that, you know, their ability to put things into some simpler graphics, motifs, whatever, but that that was real functional for me. That made a lot of complicated things seem a little bit clearer. I really enjoyed the uh, the diver, the dead diver um, moving from earth up and down. Yeah, I enjoyed that. <laughs> the little diver died. Jumped out like he was diving in. <laughs> often, um, actually, when I'm saying the Lord's Prayer, I often think about that, the phrasing in there that talks about, um, you know, that things would be on earth as they are in heaven, which is just a beautiful image for me to think about. Mm -hmm. um, so I love that, and I like that they, you know, they obviously highlighted that, but. Um, they said the main focus, I don't know what they were referring to, but it is not, it's not the, the dead diver moving over into heaven. It's the overlapping part of what we're at, what's actually going on now. So that is, was kind of um, something I didn't really think. I mean, obviously I think about that, but not that that's necessarily the main focus. So that was um, that's cool to hear. Yeah, a lot of parables you'll hear Jesus say or start the parable by saying the kingdom of heaven is like blah, 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 blah. And it may not be something over there, or it might be over there and here. Like if we begin to act like this, you know, and 
creating those pockets of heaven on earth. I kind of got the impression that uh, the whole idea is that it never really separated, but we're blind to it. We're blind to the uh, the occurrences of heaven around us because of the sin that's in the world, and that Jesus was making these pockets that open our eyes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I like the way you said that. Um, well, uh, going back to the Venn diagram, it certainly uh, illustrated that dualistic thinking of black and white and heaven and earth and in uh, celtic spirituality there is a uh, recognition that all of creation is manifesting the kingdom of god um, and it, going back to that venn diagram when i looked at that what i thought in my head right away was thin places and I don't know if y'all uh, have heard about thin places um, it's a uh, it's a geographic place or it's um, a place between two people sharing deeply where um, the veil that separates heaven and earth is so thin you can uh, experience um that sacredness that that divinity and it was almost show, it was kind of in that venn diagram was a a great example of a thin place when i was in scotland at uh I, iona iona is a a very ancient abbey off the western mm -hmm. coast of scotland and it's known to be a thin place mm -hmm. and i was on the seashore as the mist was coming up from the from the ocean and I experienced that thin place. Mm. Um, and so it was funny to see it in a Venn diagram, <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I think Alice is r really, you keyed in on it, um, at least in my thinking, that when you open your eyes and really experience God's creation, you're, you're in the midst of, of the sacred and stuff and there isn't that separation when you say that Deacon Kathy I think about Randy I'm gonna not trying to pick on you but I just I don't think I'm ever going to forget it that we were in the parking lot setting up for church and you know we were battling the stench of the garbage and uh, the view of the cans overflowing and you know all of that <coughs> And if you think about, you know, kind of the brokenness of the world, yeah, that it, that exists. But what just happened for you in that moment is you were caught by the beauty of the sunlight hitting the trees and the mm. color. And, um, you know, and, and both were rightly present right there. And yet mm. you were caught in that moment. And I just think that's a great example of the, as Alice said, the beauty is it's there. Sometimes you're just blind to it or um sometimes the garbage you know it's too much it gets in our way from that degree. but anyway don't mean to call you out but i i just was very moved by that day and that, was, that we had i think it harkens back to um moses and the burning bush uh god had to get moses attention as he's wandering around in the desert so who wouldn't have their attention drawn to a bush that burns and is not consumed but besides the theatrics of that it's the moses take off your shoes you're standing on holy ground mm -hmm. and that has that has uh, a lot of mileage to it i mean can we say that you know when when you're with a person you dearly love you're standing on holy ground because mm -hmm. you're more open to the the sacred that is in the midst of you um, and so even in the midst of stinky garbage, that was holy ground. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, let's go to the Matthew passage here. Um, this introduction says the heaven, the new heavens and earth is not some strange world we can't begin to understand. 
when Jesus talks about the new creation, he mentions things we are familiar with, like family, homes, places of work, the fields. But things will also be different than the world we know now. The future earth will be so permeated with God's own life and love that death will be no more and power structures will be turned upside down. What happened to Jesus on Easter morning is what God has in store for the whole universe. Everything will be made, will be renewed. So let's read this passage. And who would like to read Matthew 19, verses 28 to 30? Okay, Marla. <laughs> okay, I can read that. We're being pointed to. So. Yeah, I know. I tried to throw him off there. And Jesus said to them, truly, I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms for my name's sake will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Okay. Thank you. So here's our question. Just take a moment to... Uh, can everybody see them okay? If you just to look them over, we'll take a few moments of silence. And, and then if you will kind of weigh in on what question speaks to you. I was thinking about on question three, um, right now with the, the vaccine coming out, um, all the people who are getting it first are the wealthier nations like, like our country. And of course the poorer people are going to get it last and probably women and children probably dead last. Um, and so I think in the kingdom of heaven, it wouldn't be like that. It would be equal or that they would be getting it first. I'm, I'm not um, being successful in coming up with any scenarios in my mind of uh, a hurting and broken situation in, in my personal life for me personally. But, the, but question three, which I think about uh, fairly often, I guess it's so, it can, it can have so many like potential components to that. Like what, it can mean so many different things. Mm -hmm. So I have a hard time like wrapping my head around it um, in terms of like, if you just think of the infinity number of, of things in our world that, you know, are ranked to first and last and, you know, kind of like what Jared was saying, you may, I think about like poor people or people who are struggling, people who are um, disenfranchised or um, don't really have a voice in the world because they don't have money or power or whatever. Um, they're obviously, you know, we would think of them as being the least or, you know, um, I just, I have a hard time wrapping my head around that. I, I have a, a thing for question three, since everybody else has started to talk about it, it kind of made me think of something a little more personal. And it says, who usually gets to enjoy the first, the best, and most powerful scenarios on earth? And I think as a mother giving birth, that is something that, that is the, it's the best thing for you because you have such a bond with that child that the husband doesn't really have and I think you know but then after the baby is born you know she's the one who has to stay up at night you know so you're getting the best and then you're you're getting some of the you know mundane tasks to me that was kind of um you know was very um you know they get to play and they have a lot of fun but the, the father doesn't really get to ever experience that miraculous thing so for me that's what I came up with on three I think on question two, Father Frank, I thought when it talked about how Jesus has taken this on, all our sins, sometimes, you know, when you read the Bible or if you think about your life, sometimes you're just overwhelmed with bad mistakes and you constantly need to think about it. You're not, you know, you still have a chance, even though you're imperfect. But as long as you follow along the guidelines, 
So Jesus said, you kind of come into that space where you can connect even as an imperfect person and you have a chance. So I think tonight that kind of goes along with question one, two. And it just between that, if, when we read the Bible and we think about at the end of that, even though the nation of Israel went through all the things that they did and constantly think, why did God put up with them? Well, why does he put up with us today? It's the same thought. So we do have that sacrifice that Jesus gave to give us hope. Thank you, Randy. All right, well, let's go look at Romans here. Um, Paul says, while we wait for the new creation, we have to deal with evil, death, and chaos. But when Paul reflects on the future hope of the world, he says the earth will be, quote, liberated from its bondage of decay. Paul says that creation is groaning like a woman in childbirth. The new creation is taking form, being knit together in our midst, even when we can't see it. But we see hints of it. Every now and then we see a movement on the surface, and one day soon it will be pushed forth into the fullness of life. Who would like to read Romans 8, 18 to 24? I'd love to because it's my favorite, one of my favorites. <laughs> For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth repeated compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to feel futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. Thank you. Here are two questions here. I'm just asking you to read them and then we'll check in and and see how they, these questions are speaking to you. Courtney. If I can chime in. So I, you know, that the question one about the childbirth metaphor, I mean, just as we were talking about the birth of a child is like the most special thing, right? And only the mother can experience that, um, you know, dad has to stand off to the side. like that's what God is experiencing or what he will experience this beautiful birth of the new creation. And, but there's a lot of labor that goes on <laughs> before then. And that's not a whole lot of fun. <laughs> so, uh, but that all goes into the beautiful thing that's produced. Well, my impression with the idea of uh, a woman in labor, it's not, you're not in labor the whole time. You have these periods of rest in between. And I see that in the history of the world. We get these good peaky times and then we get the valleys and we back and uh, up and and, you've, and the doctors say, oh, that baby's almost there. And it's another hour <laughs> because <laughs> the, back, the baby goes back. It, it's like, you never know in labor everybody's labor is a little bit different and you can't predict exactly when the highs and lows are going to be there but they are there and 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 you have to take advantage and breathe and rest when the when the pressure is off and i think that's kind of with how it is with life you have to breathe and rest when the pressure goes off if you don't if you push keep pushing onward you're going to wear yourself out and you're not going to be able to make it to that beautiful newborn baby. I have a, I have a story to tell for about my dad. My dad, when I was having my first child, my dad didn't understand why any man would want to be in the delivery room, you know, and he just, he just didn't get it, you know, because when I was born, he was off doing something else. And so, you know, women just didn't do that in the fifties. But when my dad got a chance to come into the labor, labor room, he, he had the nurse uh, tell him all about the machine that was hooked up to me about the, about the highs and lows of when you'd go into the, uh, you know, when you'd have the, the peak of your uh, contraction. 
And it, it was kind of funny because my dad would tap me on the, on the shoulder like this, right next to my head. He goes, okay. He goes, you're going to hit the peak now. Now it's going down. And he would talk, he talked to me through entire several contractions and we couldn't get him out of there. Other people wanted to visit me, but my dad was just, he, it's like, dad, I can feel it. You know, you have to tell me when I'm going into this, you know, so <laughs> I got so irritated with Greg. <laughs> he'd, he'd been coached. You're supposed to talk her through it. And I'd be like, I know. <laughs> it's probably irrelevant, but that made me laugh more. I had the similar experience. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, you know, but it was my dad. You know, it wasn't yeah. my, you know my, my husband couldn't get back in there because my dad wouldn't leave. <laughs> I wasn't really getting the metaphor uh, initially. And then Alice said something again that just kind of hit me between the eyes when she talked about that time for rest. And for me, uh, we talk about that now as taking Sabbath time. Uh, because I think society, uh, at least in America, expects you to, to go and multitask 24 seven and taking time for yourself is that Sabbath time is that time when God can say, oh good, she stopped for a minute. <laughs> maybe I can get a word in edgewise now. <laughs> maybe, maybe I can uh, help something grow and develop in her and move forward. And just like in, I had a 23 hour labor, so I don't know, uh, we're not getting into labor stories and stuff, but <laughs> those times in between the contractions when you're working so hard is a little piece of heaven. <laughs> like, whoa, I can relax just a second, but I can see that now, thank you, Alice, <laughs> of, <laughs> of expanding that metaphor of, how we live our lives and all that labor that, and the intensity that we put into things, we have to balance out with that period of rest, that Sabbath time where God finally says, whew, I'm glad they sat down and put their feet up a minute so that I can love them now. And uh, yeah, so this finally kind of uh, made some more sense to me. Well, maybe it's because I've never been in labor, um, but I, I kind of thought about it in terms of, you know, as a church community, as a faith community, we can do many things together and many churches come together to do good works of some type, you know, some kind of outreach. But if, if we don't have those, uh, that, those moments where we also get nourishment or maybe it's the rest that where we pray and praise together um, and are fed and are, we find community in one another, you know, that, that, that leads us out. I mean, think about that last um, question a little bit about asking God to turn our hearts, homes, neighborhoods, cities into pockets of heaven on earth. I think that's what churches are in some ways, parts of, of the outreach is trying to do both within ourselves and then how do we carry those actions forward but wow you know to to change even a part of a neighborhood where saint matthews is it just feels like a daunting experience but what is the next right thing that we can do you know how is how that makes a huge difference or a huge impact even though it's a small step and there's a rhythm to it right we can't just give and give and give and give and give and give and give um, we give, but we also uh, are nourished and strengthened to go back out again. And there's a pattern to that, I think, in some ways. You know, Father Frank, when I think about what you just said, it kind of reminds me about this Bible study. You know, we, a couple of us hurried to, to eat, you know, and poor Alice, she's going to eat later. But, uh, the, but the whole thing is, it was just like we took a little bit of time out and we're getting a whole lot out of it. You know what I'm saying? It, yeah. Your Sabbath some, sometimes doesn't always have to be very long. It could only be for an hour. But look at all the fellowship that we've received here. Very good. 
I think, too, like, I know we drove by the church several times, you know, it doesn't look like much is going on, but you stop and think about community day, and when we've been able to meet together, of course, my favorite's coffee hour, I like to go straight to that, and talk to everybody. <laughs> Certainly, you know, that way, that church there, it, they might not come to that church, but when they drive by, they see some things going on. It might make them think about God and uh, maybe it could change some things. Uh, if, oh, go ahead, Missy. It's okay. Uh, I was just kind of playing on what Randy was saying. I think that last sentence in question two, I'm sure the reasons I go to church and want to live in faith are far more complex than this, but I think that, that Sunday visit is about that. What can I do to help hearts, homes, neighborhoods, cities? That's a way to renew it for me. That's, that's all. Thank you. And I didn't have anything earth shattering to say either. I don't know if you guys had heard um, that uh, Pelosi and Schumer and McConnell and um, McCarthy are all going to church together tomorrow in the mo in the morning. Wow. And to me, that is like, I actually got a little emotional when I was talking about it earlier because it's like how, you know, different and there's so many ways are all these people and whether it's a symbolic act or, I mean, obviously it is, but I mean, to me, like that just speaks volumes, I'm hoping to what's gonna maybe be coming uh, in the future, this, the fact that these top politicians who are so on opposite ends of the spectrum are going to go to church together in the morning. Are they going to St. John's? Yeah. I didn't hear, I didn't actually read the article. I just saw the little blurb of a headline. Hold on. Yeah. Because that's St. an Episcopal John's. church. That that's would be a big thing. So. <laughs> I don't think they're going to use tear gas to get there. I hope not. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to pop it. <laughs> oh, that, that's cool. Thanks. Yeah, for I thought that was wonderful. Yeah. It gives me some hope. <laughs> yeah. Oops. <laughs> Sorry, I just think today in our um, professional development at school, we were talking about. Um, if we want to be social justice educators, that you have to be willing to um, to agitate. That's one of the stages: is to be an agitator and to shake things up a little bit so that we get different results than we've always gotten. And um, so I think that applies to to when we're talking about uh, what does it look like to build pockets of the kingdom of God in in our homes and our in our neighborhoods and our city. Is we have to be willing to to be agitators. And then I thought, what is more of an agitation than a childbirth? You know, like, like Alice was talking about, this <laughs> weird, violent thing that women have to go through to produce life. Um, it kind of tied together for me. Thank you. Well, when you are in um, formation of any kind, uh, you, you learn to be called on the spot to pray. So I'm going to call on Courtney Murakowski, our uh, field education student who's in formation to, uh, to pray us out, if you would, please. <laughs> I, I wondered. Uh, let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the time of fellowship that we have together. You give us the gift of fellowship even when we have challenges such as COVID and technological challenges. That helps your kingdom to grow. We pray that we'll be a part of that growth as we move out forward during this week and throughout our lives. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Courtney.